Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you all for being here today. I want to thank you for your service to our nation. Um, also, coming here, taking time out of your busy schedules to lend us your expertise on the amphibious force structure and to answer some of our questions. Also, I want to thank your families for their sacrifices. I know that's sometimes overlooked or forgotten. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear to everybody in this room and to Congress that our intent is to fund. Uh, the LPD-28 or an additional LPD-17 class ship. Um, this committee authorized $800 uh, million in multi-year procurement. Uh, I think the Senate authoriz authorizing committee did 650 and the Senate Appropriations Committee did $800 billion. Um, so it's absolutely clear the intent is that Congress wants um, the, uh, the 12th ship in the LPD-17 class. Uh, I think it's extremely important. Um, as well, and also the Commandant has expressed a, a, a huge amount of interest, calling uh, you know these ships the Swiss Army knives of the fleet, and they're capable of doing multiple things, um, and you know not only just projecting force, but serving as a deterrent, also being able to provide humanitarian assistance, evacuations, the list goes on. Uh, so, General Paxton, um, and could you kind of elaborate, um, and in your view? What, what has the Marine Corps, what are their amphibious assault assets today, and what do you think they're going to need um, moving forward? Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, again, great colleagues here beside us. So there's a, there's a good work be, uh, amongst the Navy Marine Corps team on the way ahead. Uh, in this particular case, we happen to be the ones who are trying to articulate the requirements in order to do that power projection, knowing full well, and I'll come back to this at the end, that we have some fiscal and constraints and caps there, and I'll defer to Secretary Stackley to articulate what this means in terms of the overall shipbuilding program. In terms of the requirements, as I tried to allude to in the comments, the 38 amphibious ships is the stressing case for the simultaneity of two operations plans. Uh, we'd talk about that in a more classified environment, but that represents the assault echelon of two expeditionary brigades, which is what we need for, again, uh, two operation plans. What we understand, though, is in a day-to-day -day environment, it's the, it's the currency and the simultaneity of the demands from the five geographic combatant commanders that stress our force on a day-to-day -day basis. So, sir, see if I can answer both of those. Uh, there is a, a hard and fast requirement for 38 ships to do uh, the 2MEB two, two assault echelon requirement. Uh, we agreed, uh, at least in paper and as recently as 2009, that we can live within fiscal constraints for 33. Uh, built into that, the math of that equation is a 90 percent availability of the ships, that there is always 10 percent that are in maintenance. Uh, we struggle under the existing number of ships today, uh, and the Navy, despite great work, uh, is always challenged to get ships into the maintenance cycle. So as we have things go on around the world, in Yemen, in Libya, in Syria, in the hurricanes and tornadoes and and super typhoons in Hainan in the Pacific. Uh, we are repeatedly asked to respond to those. We, re we are ready to do that, but it breaks the maintenance cycle, and that's what stresses the force. Uh, when we responded last November to Super Typhoon Damian in the, in the Philippines, uh, we, were, we had Marines from the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Brigade on B-22s and en route to the Philippines in somewhere between five and six hours. But it took us several weeks to get two ships out of the maintenance cycle out there. And um, I want to be on the record that Admiral Harris and Admiral Thomas did great work to get them out of the yards and get them down there, but there were two others we couldn't get there. And we knew by doing that, though, we are going to break the maintenance cycle for those ships, and that would further degrade the uh, responsiveness of the 31st Mu in the Western Pacific area. So that is yet another case, just as the Special Purpose MAGTAF and the move to Juba earlier, that just shows that we are at the case or the position now where the, not only the paucity in numbers, but the maintenance requirements in an aging fleet stresses the use of that, and consequently the Navy Marine team who is forward deployed and ready to do things is always challenged to get there fast enough, to stay long enough, and to be able to reset so that we can get the ships back into maintenance. Well, I have another question, but I will probably run over my time if he tries to answer it. All right. Well, General Paxton, the recent Navy 30-year shipbuilding plan discusses the building of the LXR. Uh, what capabilities do you need in this ship to best support the Marine Corps mission? Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, when we tried to articulate requirements, and I'm sure all the members of the committee, given your great experience and your fine support for us, understand there's five fingerprints of lift. So we're looking about the number of 
individual Marines you can put on a ship with their personal equipment. That is fingerprint number one. We are looking at vehicle spots to get uh, rolling stock on and off the ship. We are looking at cube and square for those vehicles and for cargo. And then most importantly, we are looking for deck spots for aviation, for a rotary wing aircraft, and then well deck spots for connectors and ship to shore movers, well, it's a, whether it is an AAV or a LCU uh, LCAC. We are trying to balance all five fingerprints of those lift. And as Secretary Stackley said earlier, we have great design records from previous ships, and we understand the trade space between a flight deck, a well deck, and number of people. But how we maximize those five capabilities, how we do it within existing cost constraints is the challenge for all of us. So as the Marine Corps, we will try to articulate what we actually need given changes in technology to get the, the, the Marines and their equipment ashore. Uh, we are trying to hold down the weight of our vehicles, but the weight of vehicles continues to increase. We are trying to hold down the size of the aircraft, but the wingspan continues to increase. As we get great capability from our V-22s, we are now trying to make sure the V-22, like the CH-46, is detachment capable, which means you have an independent maintenance capability with them. So all of these create stressors on the design of the ship, and we are trying to make sure that the ability to project, launch, recover, and sustain the force can be done within the design capability of the ship and the costs that were uh, afforded or the monies that were given. So doing this within the challenge of Virginia and Ohio class replacement and everything, even as Marines, we understand the challenge the Department is, is under. So we are grateful for the uh, support that you show, but I will not defer here to Secretary Stackley. We know that we are probably going to need more money, to be honest with you, above TOA to make sure the amphibious ship portfolio can sustain while we are doing submarines and surface class combatants. So thank you, sir. We thank the gentleman for his questions. His time has expired. I think uh, this subcommittee recognizes that that funding for the LPD would not have been in there without his hard work and also the gentleman from Virginia, Chairman of the Readiness Subcommittee, who both worked very, very hard to make sure that was done. The, um,